Welcome, welcome, everyone. Thanks for sticking with us as we close out uh, an epic first day at Mainnet. So like Selka said, this is going to be a little different. Uh, we're going to try and keep it pretty casual. Uh, some of us have already started, so I uh, hope you are as well. And the way this session is going to work uh, is we're going to start with a traditional panel. We're going to ask some of these esteemed panelists some awesome questions about how we get to the next million users uh, and kind of just riff from there. And then after the panel, we're going to let audience members come up on stage. So if you want to come swap out for one of uh, our panelists, you can continue the conversation about wherever we go next. Uh, if you have something you want to bring up, uh, definitely start lining up over here under the projector, and we'll get you up when we get started. Um, and so without further ado, we'll start the panel. Uh, and then again, uh, feel free to grab a drink, come over here, line up for when you want to get on stage, uh, and then we'll get going. So uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, we have Paul Veritakit, Maria Shen, uh, Annette Rolovikova, uh, Preston, or James Presswich, and uh, Michael uh, uh, Blam, Blam, Flamdidge, Flamdidge. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, just to start off, I'd love for all of you to introduce uh, the organizations that uh, you work for, and then we can get going from there. Paul, you want to start? Sure. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm a partner at Pantera Capital. I focus on early stage investments. Uh, our firm, we manage about $5.5 billion. We invest in all asset classes, early stage tokens, early stage venture capital, and also liquid trading. And really excited to be here. Thanks. Hi, my name is Maria. I work at a crypto-focused VC firm based in San Francisco called Electric Capital, and we invest in early stage crypto ideas. Hi, I'm Anand, and I'm from Ethereum Magicians, which is a community of everyone who supports Ethereum, and we run a forum uh, which is based uh, on technical difficulties of Ethereum and IPs and ERCs. Uh, I'm James Prestwich. I'm a protocol engineer at C-Labs, working on bridges and interoperability in the Celo ecosystem. Uh, my background's in like Bitcoin and stuff, so I'm not even sure why I'm here. <laughs> uh, and I'm Michael Bramlage. Uh, I'm the First CEO of, uh, of Quid Inc. We're a marketplace for buying and selling digital collectibles. The novel component is you buy off-chain and mint on-chain at your choice. Uh, and we're a subsidiary of Animoca Brands. Animoca Brands is an early investor in OpenSea, Dapper, Axie Infinity. They also operate uh, Formula One Delta Time and have a few other interesting subsidiaries, one of which is the Sandbox, if you're familiar with, with that metaverse. And obviously, pleased to be here. Awesome. Thank you all uh, for those quick intros. And the idea of having a very broad panel is that when we talk about getting to one, the next 1 million users that can come from a variety of aspects, whether it's DeFi, NFTs, Web3, uh, or something else entirely. And so uh, to start off, are there any verticals that you think are poised over the next one to two years to bring in 1 million users uh, into crypto? And it can be across any category. Uh, Michael, do you want to start us off? Uh, sure. And this is kind of unique to me. I actually started um, my journey into crypto uh, at a physical collectibles company called Topps, the old American manufacturer of baseball cards. And our task was to sort of find a way to use what we knew about technology, digital, the internet, to sort of innovate on physical card collecting. So that's sort of my background. It's been my passion. And I think that as a category is really ripe to be fully digitized and to fully um, bring in not just a million, but 10 million, 100 million people into the world of, uh, of crypto via NFTs. And the reason that is, is um, it's one of those classic sort of, uh, you know, is the substitute 10x better of an experience than the current sort of incumbent situation? And in this regard, just the liquidity, um, the fun, the fact that the, the medium of an NFT is code and not cardboard, uh, just makes it so much cooler. And so I think that's a huge uh, category uh, and vertical that's ripe for uh, bringing in the next the next 10 million. James, any thoughts? Um, I'm, I'm still a little unsure who the first million users have been. Um, <laughs> so it's difficult for me to like talk about the next million users. When I started doing this, there were like you know 20,000 people in the space, and we were all just working on Bitcoin stuff. Uh, I am a little bewildered by the growth of the past six, seven years. Uh, I'm interested in NFTs. I'm interested in DeFi and in payments. 
Uh, but you know, I'm, I don't really know where the next million users are going to come from, and I haven't figured out where the first million came from. <laughs> Go for it. I believe that the first billion people will come from the art industry, because uh, lately a lot of people has been entering the blockchain industry from the art and creative industry. So I believe that that's where we are heading. And especially as the DeFi summer last year happened, now it's uh, NFT summer. So we are just getting more and more users from more creative industry. Um, so I believe that's where we are getting more people involved. Yeah, I would echo that thought that um, I, I think the creative industry has contributed so many new people to the crypto space. Um, I, I think if you would have asked me where most of the users will be coming from or how we're going to get to mainstream users earlier, I would have said, um, I would have said DeFi because I think the yields are so obvious. Like, would you like yields or would you not like yields? And I, I think most people like yields. Um, so I thought that was a really obvious choice. But I think the truth of the matter is that human beings are not actually purely logical financial machines and we're very emotional and we have attachments. And I think that's where NFTs really come in because they bring the sense of community and belonging and identity to people. Um, and, and it's building on what the internet has been doing best, which is creating and fostering these small micro communities. And now NFTs are kind of the webbing that ties everyone together. Um, so I, I definitely believe that the next million will be coming from the NFT space. Awesome. And how attached are you to your uh, Board Ape Yacht Club? Oh, I am my Board Ape. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, I love it a lot. I think it's a, it's a great community. And um, yeah, I, I'm happy to have my Board Ape represent me online. Yeah. Paul, any uh, thoughts on where the next million come from? Yeah, so I'll start off with where I've seen the first million come from. And while there's a lot of stuff going on in the domestic market, I believe that there's been a lot of activity in the emerging markets, which is quite fascinating. So we made an early investment in a company called Coins.ph. And, you know, sort of giving people access to crypto, but really digital banking and being able to then sort of have them be able to pay their bills using crypto or digital dollars and be able to do remittances using cryptocurrency and really just solving that pain point around being able to just get to um, the digital age and be able to manage their own money and be able to actually use it for certain things without having to go through banks, which is such a, a pain in the ass over there. I, I've talked to users over there that spend uh, 30 days just setting up a bank account, which is uh, completely inefficient. And they actually accumulated 5 million users, so a tenth of the entire population in the Philippines was on this platform that enabled them to get cryptocurrencies. And then we've invested into Latin America, we've invested into Southeast Asia. So I think with now yields and other you know, advantages of DeFi emerging for these more centralized platforms, we are going to see, because Bitso has 2 million users, we're going to see more and more growth over there. But I would say that like the creative economy and what I'm seeing from DAOs especially, I do think that the momentum is shifting over there, and um, that's where we can see probably even faster growth. And tens and millions of users is around people enabling just you know sort of decentralized governance for any sort of organization and having uh, token incentives behind it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one part of that that uh, is almost unique to crypto is that it's not very mobile first friendly. Um, does anyone have an, a, a thoughts on how we can make the mobile experience better and how that can enhance us get to a greater user base? Whether from DeFi or the NFT side? Uh, sure. Um, get Apple to put SecP256K1 <laughs> into their secure enclave. Uh, that, that's the only answer on how to make uh, the mobile experience better. And can you expand on that, like, for those who are less familiar with that uh, specific uh, section? <laughs> um, basically, all cryptocurrencies use a signature algorithm called SecP256K1. Uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, everybody. Um, and it's not supported in the uh, secure enclave that handles your touch ID and your face ID and every other secret on the iPhone. Uh, and it's not supported in the secure enclave on Android devices either. Uh, the real like hurdle towards a great, secure, safe mobile experience is uh, hardware support 
for the crypto primitives that we use. And Michael, do you have any thoughts on from the NFT side? Because I know gaming is obviously going to be a huge application in crypto eventually. Gaming is largely mobile first right now. Um, how, do we, how do we get there, uh, whether it's from individual NFTs and marketplaces uh, to full-scale games? Yeah, I mean, I would say ask Apple and Google. I would sort of agree uh, <laughs> with what he said. Um, we're sort of at the mercy of them in terms of you know, platform risk and, uh, and, and all that. But I think I'm glad you brought up games. None of us had mentioned the games vertical as um, you know, sort of that, that front door to the next 10 million or 100 million. And I do think that that as a vertical is incredibly compelling. If you think about the sort of evolution of games, it was you'd pay $60 for a disc to put on a console. Then it became free to play. Free to play was fantastic because it basically 10x the number of players globally, but not that fantastic in the sense that at its worst, free to play is very predatory against a small subset of players. And what I love about, let's say, play to earn is the proposition is so strong and it can be communicated in such simple terms to a player of a video game. You can actually make money while you play video games. It can be a small amount. It can be used to recoup your investment and time in the game, or you could actually make a living off of playing video games. And I firmly believe that in 10 years, we'll all look back and sort of say, I can't believe I played video games and didn't make money <laughs> from the experience. So that, that, that's really a category where you, where you can, you know, whether it's Paul talking about pain points, you could actually stop a gamer on the street and they would say, yeah, like that, that exchange of value isn't fair, right? I'm giving them all of this and I'm really not getting any in return. So that's a, just a huge opportunity, but in terms of whether that evolves first on the desktop or uh, evolves on mobile, I think you have to kind of watch Apple and Google a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's a huge tip of the spear for me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say the same thing. I mean, I just wrote a, a blog post on my blog, Verata Verdict, but basically play to earn is, um, is sort of a new innovation for uh, crypto gaming and, of course, NFTs and what you can sort of enable why people owning their own virtual items and being able to have a, a real marketplace around that and be able to have a bit more sort of interoperability around that, I think just creates more revenue streams for gaming and more engagement. I, I do agree that Apple and Google have been sort of gatekeepers around making it better for, especially crypto gaming, where a lot of it is mobile first. But I think browser-based gaming could be very interesting, especially because most of the wallets and, and sort of trading right now is, is on wallets like MetaMask and Phantom, et cetera. So uh, browser-based gaming, while may not be exactly the same experience, but I do think that could be an easy way for more crypto users to you know, more easily integrate into those games. And uh, you uh, mentioned Google, uh, Apple. As we look at what Web3 might create in terms of new social networks, uh, how do you envision those being different in a crypto-native world uh, versus how they exist today. Yeah, I think we're already seeing a completely social, different social graph than what we're indexing on Facebook and Instagram and, and even Twitter. Um, even though crypto Twitter is, is so active in its own community, but there are so many sub-communities within that, that where people can't find each other, right? So for example, if you belong to an NFT community, you know, people manually kind of create these lists to say like, okay, who's actually in the Board Ape Yacht Club or like who's actually in Cool Cats? And I, I think we're developing these new connections to people based on ownership, whether that's NFT ownership or token ownership um, that's not indexed by any of the traditional social media companies. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for new social networks to emerge based on the inherently different connectivity that we have in the crypto space. Yeah, um, go, I'll go for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is fascinating. I mean, there's, there's a few different ways you can go about it, but I, I think, you're, you, as you mentioned, these protocols and um, use cases around just, you know, um, trying to just discuss different topics and the DAOs that are creating around, I, I consider those social networks too. I also think that like one thing that I think people are trying to figure out is who, who are actually token holders out there and, and how do I communicate to other token holders and things like that. So we've seen a few of these different projects, but like being able to create communities of social networks based off of who actually has your tokens, uh, whether it's like you want to be out there, whether you want to be more pseudo-anonymous, and then really be able to 
uh, not only like share information, learn information, but actually even coordinate things around governance, things like that could be very interesting. And as you talk about uh, governance uh, and finding out who the token holders are and incentivizing their uh, participation, what uh, today do you think could be better? Because if we get to 1 million users but we only have 10,000 participants, that seems unsuccessful. So what is the proper way to kind of build in that uh, incentivization for governance? Uh, Annette, do you have any thoughts? Yeah. Wow, that is a really difficult question. Um, I think today, I mean, people are experimenting with different ways of looking at governance, right? There's two, one is um, everyone gets a vote, and then the other one is you get, your share of the vote is based on the number of tokens that you own, or you can delegate to someone. I feel, I was, I was just having a conversation with um, someone who's really active in DAOs yesterday, and I, I think, I mean, governance is part of the problem. Um, it, it, it is a friction point for sure, but I think another piece of friction is how do you have the right participants in contributing to the DAO, right? Not just in, in terms of when it, hey, it's time for a decision, like please cast your vote. I think it's also who's, who's actually writing the code in your community and who's actually doing the designing and who's actually doing the outreach. Um, everyone has a role to play and that kind of ecosystem becomes infinitely more difficult to coordinate and infinitely more, uh, less efficient the bigger that community is. Um, I don't think there's a clear answer that I know of. I, I welcome anyone to, to come up with another idea that um, can incentivize the right type of participation today, but I certainly think being able to incentivize people to vote, um, being able to incentivize people to participate in, in the right ways in DAOs and communities is, is probably the one, one of the biggest questions and problems in the space today. Definitely. Um, I think that we are kind of solving these issues with DAOs, uh, and just by the fact that we, projects are doing airdrops of their governance tokens. They're incentivizing their users in order to use their token and participate in governance processes. And that's the way how uh, projects are incentivizing their users in order to be a part of their governance and work for the DAO and share the ideas of the DAOs. And especially big projects have to be more like Delphi and decentralized governance to users and let their users be in the power of uh, their governance processes within the projects. Uh, so that's the way how we can bring more governance into the ecosystem and more decentralizing power into the users and then it's up to DAOs and DAO members to be a part of uh, the governance and try to be active and try to get their spot in the governance and try to build uh, the future of the DAO itself within the project. No, definitely. I think uh, DAOs are going to be uh, an interesting uh, transition. Do, uh, out of curiosity, you believe that the transition to a, a DAO world will happen in this interim step where we have mixed uh, infrastructure, Lao type DAOs? Uh, do you think that crypto native DAOs make more sense for specific use cases uh, and that those will be adopted more, more rapidly in the future? The DAOs are already happening. So we see a huge DAO fighting kind of transition <laughs> within the space. Uh, so there are many new DAOs coming up every day. Um, the Lao did a very good job with uh, trying to make their, themselves official identity and also the United States, uh, the, some states made the LS, LSC as DAO, so that's the first step in order to have more official DAOs out there. So now we are just going to grow the space more within the DAOs. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll go next. I mean, so I, I think there's, a lot of different things that need to happen for DAOs to really succeed. And I think there's just uh, many parts that people are tackling. But I think, you know, even for, for just talking about one part and one that I think has been sort of a problem for us is 
you know, if we want, you know, we now have a, a fairly large portfolio of projects that have uh, governance and to be able to figure out when we need to do something and what's going on with each of these different issues. I mean, it's going to log into the Discord, it's going through crypto Twitter, it's having direct conversations with the teams themselves, they have a forum out there. I mean, there's just so much information. And so if there was a way to be able to, and, and maybe it's, it's on mobile, but you know, again, we have problems with mobile, but if there's just better ways for us to digest this information and uh, know when we should be actually making certain decisions, I mean, that would just be huge already, even for like the larger shareholders, if not like, you know, other people that are, you know, not as engaged and not as incentivized. Yeah. Um, I think uh, another kind of part of this coin is not only the users, but the developers is, I think that that has been challenging uh, to some degree to bring on uh, developers from uh, broader ecosystems, from different programming languages. Uh, are there steps that you think uh, can be taken to increase the total developer base, whether on Ethereum or in this multi-chain uh, future that we're living in? It's Go for it. already happening with the hackathons. I think that um, uh, ETH Global is doing a very good job uh, with bringing more developers into the space by organizing their virtual hackathons and trying to incentivize people in order to join hackathon uh, and organizing a bunch of virtual events around that. So that's a very good way how we can start bringing more developers into this space. Yeah, I also see a lot of fintech companies or kind of storied financial institutions getting more into crypto and exploring products there. Um, and as they do that, their developers learn about crypto and then end up leaving and getting into crypto. Um, I, I actually have seen that as a process that's starting to take hold already. And so I, I think as more people in Web2 learn about, um, about crypto, maybe as Web2 companies are, are starting to pay attention, um, that is another kind of steady incoming stream of developers. Um, one of the interesting things about getting into development in this space is that the attrition rate is incredible. Uh, everyone either like gets bored or gets rich and stops writing code. Um, uh, so everybody for the last decade in this space has been looking for a repeatable education process. How can we take a developer who knows nothing about blockchains and bring them up to speed on crypto economic protocols and solidity? adversarial thinking, cryptography, all the different like weird skills that go into this. Uh, and no one's ever found one. Um, we haven't like managed to build a process where we can repeatedly train developers to do this, to produce good work in this space. Uh, and I don't uh, know how we can do that. We could build out a corpus, uh, like a body of work, but no one would read it. Uh, like, it, it's an incredibly challenging problem, and uh, whoever cracks it and can produce blockchain developers on demand is going to make a lot of money. Well, well said, well said. Um, as we uh, close out uh, the first half of this panel before we get to where we can bring some of the audience members on stage, and again, line up over on the side over here if you want to come on stage, uh, and we can start to sub you in for some of the panelists. Uh, what is one area uh, in crypto that uh, you're really excited about over the next six to 12 months? Uh, we can start with you, Michael. Yeah, I mean, I'll just repeat what I said earlier. I really think it's gaming. Um, how many billions of people on the planet play games? How sort of asymmetrical and unfair is that value exchange? Um, and how strong is the proposition of being able to make passive or active income from, from playing games? I mean, that, there's not a lot in crypto where there's like a real need in your face where someone stops on the street and they're like, I must have yield. Like the average person doesn't necessarily demand that, but the average person, the next billion, they do play these video games and they do sink time into it. And uh, it's one where I think for the longest time, game developers and game publishers have sort of have, have had the better end of the bargain uh, and it doesn't need to be that way. And so I think things like Axie Infinity are, are, are sort of showing the way where you can have a, utterly reordered economic system between you and your players. So that just excites the heck out of me. James? Um, you know, like Michael over here, I'm, 
I'm excited about my own work. Um, I work on things that I think are technically interesting and challenging. Uh, in this case, it's interoperability, bridges, and multi-chain ecosystems. Uh, we're seeing massive movement of capital from Ethereum to other chains right now. Uh, for the first time in like the whole decade that this stuff has existed. Um, so that's what I'm interested in. I'm very excited about DAOs and better governance tools of how we can uh, coordinate better as a group together. Um, I'm very excited for people to start having the opportunity to earn NFTs um, in addition to just being able to buy NFTs. I think NFTs have gotten to these prices that are really prohibitive for anyone to enter into the space. And what I'm really excited about is the ability to earn NFTs because you're a great developer or earn an NFT because you were in attendance to something or you contributed in some way. Um, and these are NFTs that no amount of money can buy. And I think that community that you can create around being able to earn NFTs, um, you know, start building an identity and reputation that's, that's past what NFTs been, have been able to do today. Um, so like Rabbit Hole, for example, what Brian Flynn is building there is incredibly interesting because there you can earn an NFT for, uh, for doing some sort of task or proving some, you have some sort of skill. And these NFTs will layer on top of each other to create your on-chain reputation. And I, I, that, that is incredibly exciting to me, I think. Yeah, I'm a big fan of rabbit hole, so I, I think that's amazing. And so I agree, NFTs are going to be really um, interesting as we go forward. I'm interested in seeing whether, f I, I'm not actually sure about this. We haven't made an investment yet, but I'm interested in seeing how fractionization of NFTs comes out and uh, will people sort of see it the same sort of way as you know investing into a full NFT. But beyond that, I, I think the other thing is around sort of brands and artists um, issuing their own NFTs and whether it's on a platform like Audius, which is a decentralized SoundCloud, or whether it's something like Royal where people can so now have like the revenue streams tied to sort of like their work and, um, and have that be potentially sort of in an NFT format. That becomes interesting. Yeah, never a shortage of interesting things going on in crypto. Um, awesome. Thank you all for uh, joining the first uh, half of this panel. Uh, now, we're going to continue the second half, so if you're out there and you want to come on stage and uh, riff with the rest of us and talk about anything from NFTs to DeFi to DAOs, uh, please uh, make your way over here. And we can get you mic'd up. I don't have a question, but I'm not sure if it's a question. Okay. So, Maria, you just mentioned the um, fun project called Wild Rabbit Hole. Yes, rabbithole.gg. Oh. It's just called rabbit hole, right? What's yeah. it about? Um, it gives people the ability to earn NFTs or and earn tokens uh, when they perform certain tasks. So I think the ability to earn, whether it is NFTs or, or other tokens, is incredibly interesting because um, it means that you participated in some way to get into the space. You didn't just trade in fiat for the token. Um, so yeah, so they've done some really great stuff with Pool Together. Um, they've done some really great stuff with Layer 2s to bring a lot of users and awareness and education from um, people who may not be using these protocols normally to, to start using and, and start engaging with these protocols. Awesome. And with that, uh, we can bring uh, the first audience member on stage. Uh, we're going to just sub out uh, from the end to the beginning. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Michael. And uh, come on stage and have a seat. <laughs> okay. And we'll get talking. So uh, really briefly, if you could just uh, introduce yourself uh, and what interests you the most in crypto. Okay, um, so this is Steve Kim from Korea, actually. Um, I'm from A41, uh, which is newly created um, crypto fund in Korea. Um, obviously, the DeFi is the most interesting part that I'm interested in because um, I think... Um, DeFi is actually opens the accessibility to people. And, you know, in traditional finances, a lot of ordinary people cannot get access to um, the core of financial system 
only like big banks and all, like only chosen people in Wall Street can actually get access to it. But right now, a lot of protocol actually uh, provide a lot of yield, like more than 20%. Like Anchor is providing like fixed 20% yield on stable coins. So all those great opportunities that DeFi are providing is actually um, awesome and it's, it's, it's kind of shocking too, um, if you think about it. So um, the DeFi is like the most um, part that I'm interested in. It. And I, th I, I think I, I, w I want to ask some questions um, to the panel. So, uh, go for it, fire a question away. Yeah, um, so I think as the crypto scenes are going into the mainstream, um, a lot of governmental agencies and governmental bodies are um, closely monitoring a lot of projects and a lot of um, companies that are related to blockchain. And what do you think about like, whether or not we have to be careful? Or be because you know, I thought that the fundamental philosophy behind blockchain technology is kind of contradictory to um, the, the government itself because when it was started, you know, it was started from all the anarchists and all the libertarian ideas and stuff. But right now, a lot of government agencies are um, trying to regulate those um, kind of protocols. And a lot of people actually, they said, they encourage actually people to work with government agencies. But I'm not sure whether or not that actually we can go along with them or can we actually fight against them. So I, I don't have like some clear solution to that, so I want to ask the question. Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. When I got into this, uh, it was mostly libertarians and anarcho-capitalists, uh, and which I'm very much not. Uh, I, I got into this for a lot of the reasons that you were talking about DeFi, is the ability for anyone to participate in the financial system. You can go out, you can run a Bitcoin node, you can verify the whole thing, you can check that everything's done correctly, you can participate directly in the financial system. Um, I think the, the reality of the matter is all of these people tend to live in a country uh, and there tends to be a government for a country and uh, maybe a few people want to go out and be freedom fighters and want to you know, like fight against the government but the majority of people just don't have that option. Uh, so I love that we give people the ability to participate in the financial ecosystem, to write code that affects money and to make their own decisions, and that's why I'm involved in this. And with that excellent response, we're gonna bring our next member on. So, James, please uh, sub out. And then, uh, if you could please introduce yourself. Uh, hi, yeah, my name's Aaron. Um, I, I'm the owner of a company called DeFi Development Corp. I work with Geometric Energies on the Doge One Moon mission, so that's, uh, that's a lot of fun. <laughs> awesome, yeah. awesome. Welcome. And uh, is there anything uh, we've been talking about specifically in, in getting to uh, one million, the next one million users? Where do you think that's going to come from? Um, well, I don't know about the, like the next million. One of my big concerns is the current million users. Um, if you look at services like OpenSea, um, they're pushing out billions of dollars right now, and they have virtually no KYC for any of their customers. And if something like that were to like start getting investigated, wouldn't that cause like a huge ripple? I mean, it's uh, to me, I think that's concerning. But uh, yeah. I think that the nature of uh, Open Web3 ecosystem is the fact that we don't need to KYC into, in order to buy JPEGs uh, or in order to interact with the chain, buy tokens, uh, use DEX, and similar dApps. Uh, so I don't think so that having KYC on, for example, OpenSea would be a great idea. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, it's an interesting problem, but. Uh, I think that there's the, the nature of our industry is not always based in KYC, so I think that there's a, a spectrum of solutions. Uh, thank you, Net. And with that, we're going to bring on the next person. And if you could uh, introduce yourself real quickly. Hello. Um, Working. Um, I'm Nicholas. Uh, I work at Kaiko. Uh, Kaiko Data, we're a crypto market data provider. Um, and I wanted to shift the conversation a little bit towards emerging markets. Um, now that we're talking about where the next billing is gonna come, and that's probably gonna be the base of the pyramid. Um, and that's one of the things that got me interested into crypto, the fact that the, it's practically borderless. But I think the, 
the beneficial part of crypto hasn't been affected so much in the emerging world, uh, like Latin America, where I'm from if, um, um, originally. Uh, I think the adoption of crypto in the first world has primarily come from institutions, and we see that by the average transaction in DeFi being so big. Uh, but in the developing world, the adoption is more driven through macro tailwinds, in my opinion, and more through the usability of crypto. Um, so, for example, Latin America being the, the biggest romantic corridor in the world, uh, Latin America having so many inflation issues, uh, lack of trust in the institutions, uh, low banking penetration, um, and at the same time, um, having a huge entrepreneurship environment, um, having regulation open to crypto, which is something that people are not talking about that much, besides El Salvador, of course. Um, so yeah, I wanted to shift the conversation to that. I know we have a lot of VCs in the, in the conference and we've seen these huge numbers being poured into companies over here in the first world, but um, I, props to Paul, I know you mentioned you, you invested in some companies in, in Latam, it's one of the first times that I, that I heard it. Um, so yeah, just wanted to shift the conversation to, to that side, to the opportunities that there, the marginal benefit of a person in Latam from crypto is way bigger than in the first world. Like, just as a crazy example, imagine an airdrop to a person in Colombia, in the outskirts of Colombia. Imagine the benefit that it could have in their life and in their families. Uh, the transparency of getting, for example, 90 cents on the dollar from the remittances instead of 70. Like these marginal benefic benefits are gonna be more impactful in the third world and for more people than in the first world. So that's kind of where I wanted to shift the conversation. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I think whenever I speak to someone in the United States and I talk about the benefits of crypto, it's not always very clear, but when I'm talking to someone from an emerging economy and I say, well, you know, it gives everyone access to financial products, it's actually completely transparent, um, you, uh, you know, it's, it's a hedge against inflation. All of these things just make intuitive sense, I think, uh, just because the financial system in the United States is functioning, right? And I think there's only so much improvement, um, and it's, it's not enough benefit for a lot of people to, to see what is so game-changing and what is so uh, is such a paradigm shift with crypto. So I absolutely agree. I also think that, uh, uh, you know, people who are more beneficiary in the current financial system, they're of course not gonna wanna switch to a new financial system that they don't have figured out yet, right? I mean, they're already making bank in the current one, they're not gonna wanna just like roll the dice on another thing. So anybody who isn't benefiting from the current financial system, of course, is gonna wanna hop on board and so emerging uh, countries would definitely be uh, a place for that to happen, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we invested early in Zappo, uh, which uh, has been helping people you know, actually use Bitcoin for certain use cases around e-commerce and payments in Argentina. Also, Ripio, which is uh, Bitpagos, also was enabling both a brokerage and exchange for crypto in Argentina. And, you know, the story about Wences and uh, the CEO of Zappo and also Sebastian, CEO of Ripio and Bitpagos, saying that in their lifetimes, they've seen the value of the Argentinian peso drop to zero three times already, shows that, like, you know, this is a great... Um, you know, great way to sort of hedge inflation. And then, of course, the Bitso investment having, you know, now 2 million active users in crypto. What we've seen right now, like you mentioned, is driven by Global Macro, where a lot of them have bought Bitcoin during this pandemic, um, knowing that this is going to be a great store of value. And also stable coins, too, USDC and uh, Tether, the, the buying over there, plus all the remittances between US and Mexico have happened quite a bit. So I think where we need to go in terms of getting to the next million users or, or 10 million users in, in Latin America, I think is continuing to focus around probably, probably dollar-backed stable coins and maybe payments using dollar-backed stable coins as FX. I think that's been a trend a little bit down there to focusing on scalability because if we're going to get more folks into DeFi and into um, NFTs and things like that, you know, the... Uh, 
the amount per transaction needs to be decreased. And then I think from there, it's, it's further education. I mean, right now, like, there's only a small subset of people that know about crypto. So expanding, expansion over there on the educational, uh, especially right now, I think Mexico is growing. But Brazil, I think, in terms of retail traders, is, is probably the, the biggest market in Latin America. So just continue to foster the community over there. Yeah. Before we continue, I'm going to sub out our next uh, guest member. So, Maria, See you thank you. Welcome, welcome. And if you could please introduce yourself briefly. Hi, I'm John Montague, and I'm an attorney, uh, specifically in venture capital, and also focusing on cryptocurrency. Um, I had a sort of comment and question for the group, and uh, primarily to those who are actively investing in early stage crypto companies, and one one of the main questions that I receive is, okay, am I going to get in trouble for this project? Is this project a security? How is the SEC going to look at this if I get investigated? And I think with the SEC investigation of Uniswap, or at least indicating that they're doing so via the Wall Street Journal, that there's a lot of confusion going on on uh, what is and is not permissible. And my main concern with this is that it actually has an effect of consolidating power among the existing cryptocurrencies who have already raised the money and paid the fine. Like if you look at EOS, the fact that they paid a large fine to get a hall pass. So what is the counterbalance to this? And given that the SEC is trying to protect investors, what is the crypto industry uh, going to be doing to uh, make sure there's a level playing field for new participants? Anyone, any thoughts? I guess that might be directed toward me. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I, I guess there's two ways to, or there are two things I can say about that. I mean, in terms of how we look at companies and decide to make investments right now, um, it, it goes into a bunch of different factors. I mean, one of them is basically you're always investing into a team, and we do want to invest into teams that are thinking about this and not just you know dismissing it. That's number one. Uh, number two, we want to make sure that we understand the specific use case and how uh, securities regulations and things can play into effect with that specific use case. And what have they done to de-risk themselves or will do to de-risk themselves? I mean. You know, there's nothing that's uh, guaranteed or foolproof right now. Could I just like Go ask you a straight question? Yeah. So, this is sort of my opinion, mm -hmm. and the least risky way to do it is actually to not really make your protocol or utility public. To sort of, you know, build on one of these pre-existing changes. You know, of course, Ethereum being openly stated that it's not a blockchain or one of these that are on the exchanges and just saying, okay, we're gonna raise money from in a private placement standard exemptions. Is that sort of your opinion or? Um... I, I, I think in general, I mean, you shouldn't build a chain unless you really have to. Um, so I, I would advise most folks right now, there's been a lot of money and a lot of work on the regulatory side, especially for you know Bitcoin, Ethereum. To, to build on one of these chains that you know don't have as much risk over there, unless you really feel like you need to build something and uh, then want to open it up for the public. So I think in general, it's probably better, both from sort of a cost perspective and a regulatory perspective, to actually just build an a, some, a sort of application instead of uh, something you know that is uh, a new a new chain that takes a, a lot of work around just building you know technology plus also the community. And before we continue, uh, we're going to sub out our last existing panelist. Come on up. Thank you. Thanks. And looks like my mic is oh, you're good. It's working. You're good. All right. And if you could introduce yourself. Uh, right. 
Hey guys, how you doing? Nice to meet you. I'm Ryan Kumar. I'm one of the founders of Mintrops. Essentially what we do is we create experiences on the blockchain with NFTs. So we're building a no-code platform that allows creators to essentially launch their own NFTs with no code. No, no con uh, smart contract deployment that they need to do manually or any front-end development. So just trying to commoditize the space in that. We're really excited about it. Um, so I guess you guys are the panelists over here and we can get some crowd participation, no problem. Is that allowed? Sorry? Is, is the crowd participation allowed on this side? Maybe <laughs> yeah. not. Yeah. I don't know. We'll <laughs> <Go> see. <for. laughs> but, you know, in terms of, like, your guys' you know, experience, you come from law and you're, you're building something on Dogecoin, um, on, on the overall scope of, you know, the globalization of crypto, do you feel there will be a time where, you know, economies that essentially have, like, you know, you know, there, a lot of economies and a lot of countries are like leveraged labor, right? So you'll see like essentially company, uh, companies can outsource their labor to countries that essentially have, you know, lower, you know, hourly rates, et cetera. Do you feel like crypto will be like the catalyst to, you know, one of those environments where everybody will have more of an equal pay globally? Is that where we see crypto going? Just a question. I think we're actually already starting to see that, right? I mean, uh, there's there's that guy from South India who just recently became a billionaire, right? Because because of crypto, like those opportunities were just never there for him because he is in such poverty and strife. And I believe the story was he was using a thumb drive and you borrowing his friend's laptop to do the coding. So um, like it's definitely already happening. The the playing field is getting leveled, um, and like it's it's creating real wealth in people and enough wealth that these people can now make a change, right? He's got a billion bucks and he's in crypto. Now he can go in there and do stuff with it, right? Beautiful. And also one thing with the Axie, um, Axies are booming in the Philippines and a lot of people actually playing Axies to be, uh, become a billionaire and millionaire and, and they are already. So actually crypto gaming is actually changing the, um, the paradigm of um, developing countries, you know? So I think it is possible when you, know, when you guys try to play uh, games to earn something and if you participate in um, like develop, the validating network and so on, because you know, the good thing about blockchain is that it is totally open to everybody. So if you are willing to participate in the community, actually you can and you can get the reward um, automatically by participating in it. So I think the opportunity is for everyone. So that's, I think that's the good thing about like, open finances that, that blockchain brings to our community. That's true. Making a billion dollars off a of game is insane, right? <laughs> well, now they're making it off uh, illiquid JPEGs, right? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Uh, yeah, I was going to mention the, um, I mean, obviously, because I'm here, I love crypto and everything, but we do have to accept that these secular changes also got accelerated through the pandemic. And even though with all the suffering and loss that the pandemic brought, this is one of the few benefits and it's a blessing in the sky that it is creating as you mentioned a more level playing field in terms of access to opportunities and then I think the crypto industry leverages this current uh, juncture where meritocross meritocracy merit meritocracy uh, yeah it's meritocratic sorry second <laughs> second language uh, issues um, you guys know what I mean based out of merit um, this juncture leverages this fact of crypto that anyone can access these opportunities as long as you're able to do the job. Doesn't matter where you graduated, even if you graduated, if you can build, if you can add value, then all these protocols that are right now startups and probably going to be million dollar, million billion dollar companies in the future uh, are going to be employing all these people all over the world. And I think that's going to be a radical change in terms of access to, to opportunities and social mobility. True. Absolutely. And then uh, maybe kind of segueing from that conversation, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned Axie. That's definitely a strong gaming contender. I feel like that's something that we all believe is going to continue to be successful. Uh, are there any applications of NFTs, whether in DeFi or, or more consumer-based, that you're really excited about? I can mention one. Go and, for it. I mean, I shouldn't be talking about this. I don't know that much, but I just read a little bit about it and really impacted me. Uh, and it's uh, so Soari. I don't know if you guys heard of it. The fantasy uh, football cards, oh, yeah. uh, like soccer cards. Yeah, yeah. And I heard it because it was a like parallel story to the Axie Infinity in Philippines. 
Uh, there was a, like a group of people that started doing this thing with trading um, football cards in Colombia and making like very good money out of it. And it's just tied to something that's very passional in, in, in Axios gaming in general, in Suarez football. It's the biggest sport in the world, maybe not here in the U.S., but outside of the U.S. it is. The real and again, football. It's yeah. very <laughs> passionate. It's not really that economical, like, behavioral. It's just you love a team and you love it. So I think that's definitely a huge um, uh, pocket of growth that we're going to see in NFTs. And you're seeing it in football. It's probably going to spread to other sports, other activities, other countries, other uh, communities. Yeah, and I wanted to add to that. So essentially, like, um, you're seeing... Just like uh, her name was Maria, right? Maria. Maria, yeah. Yeah. So Maria was wearing a Board Ape Yacht Club sweater, right? Yep. So you're seeing like these reverse IP economies that are booming. So it's going digital first, and then physical afterwards, which is going to completely be a game changer because you're going to start to see like movie. Like there's already film studios that have had conversations with that are like, how do we start? you know, putting out NFTs for a particular IP that we believe in, but we don't know if the market is essentially going to be able to, like, grasp it or buy it or, you know, be interested in the product. So we can start seeing, like, you know, even movie companies start to put out, like, IP first and NFT form and then essentially create, like, a whole movie, even funding the movie off the IP first, right? And then it goes from completely digital on NFT, on crypto, then to actual physical, and then what does that turn into? Where it's like it hits like theaters, it hits you know merchandising, it hits toys, etc. So, I think that's going to be a complete game changer. The IP that's being created um, in NFTs, specifically in um, you know you know just content overall, and then how that's going to translate into gaming. So you're seeing like all these you know PFP projects that are turning into MMOs, and you know all these playable. Uh, you know, games. So we're going to start to see, like, that's just going to be a whole new ecosystem of creators that are going to be empowered by NFTs and crypto, right? So that's my take on that. And also, like, I recently mentioned the Anchor Protocol. Uh, Anchor, um, actually, the, the Neo Bank in New York, um, Yota, Yota Bank, I think, they are integrating Anchor Protocol uh, to provide um, fixed yield for the um, customer. So in customer's perspective, they are just depositing their dollar into the um, bank. But actually, Yoda, they actually um, turns those dollar into UST, so they can yield 20% fixed rate, and they can return to the customer. That is much higher than just legacy banks. So I think the Anchor Protocol is already integrating their system into the um, traditional and legacy banks. And in the user side, is um, the user experience is really good for Anchor Protocol. So you know. It's not just about um, creating tokens to the reward. Just they are actually generating those um, fixed rewards from the lunar uh, staking reward. So actually, it is sustainable, first of all. So and I am personally using it a lot as a, some some sort of hatching um, um, strategy because you know that's yield for a stable coin only. So I think the anchor protocol is something that I'm very interested in it and is very something that every user can actually use it without actually uh, risking uh, their asset. So I think Anchor Protocol is something that you guys have to be interested in. Awesome. Yeah, I really liked that. Uh, there's a company downstairs. They got like a LED Louis Vuitton bag, and you mail it into them. They send you an NFT. And then the cream guy was talking about lending with NFTs. So you could then take a mortgage out on your $20,000 bag and then use the capital for whatever you need it for and not have to give up your limited edition Louis Vuitton bag. So I mean, I think, I think the space of NFTs has like some crazy room to grow. And I think some of the use cases we haven't even thought of, and we might, might not even know that there are even NFTs running it in the background, right? Yeah, absolutely. The trend of fractionalization is only just starting, and, and where DeFi and NFTs intersect is, is still uh, really just a, a wide open design space. Yeah. Uh, maybe to uh, close out, uh, I have one final question. I would love to, uh, same question I asked the panelists, what is one thing in crypto that you're most excited for over the next six to 12 months? Uh, we can start at the end and come down this way. Um, I, I already mentioned about it, but you know. Uh, besides Anchor. Uh, okay, besides Anchor. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I think what um, Gabby knew, what you said you talked about, I think the uh, interchain and, uh, you know, interchain is something that um, is very hard to achieve. In theory, everything can possible, you know, but in practice, you know, the things are really a uh, little hard. And, you know, whenever I first um, got to know, like, Polkadot and Tendermint and all those kind of interchain protocol, I was very excited. But, you know, now it, it has been, like, three years or so. 
But you know, the, the, good, the good thing is they're actually uh, working really hard to um, achieve those goals that actually they mentioned three years ago. And actually, we are actually in the process of um, creating interchain world. So I think um, by um, in, in, in two, one year or two years, um, I think there will be no concept of just app application on Ethereum only, but I think application can be everywhere. Even though like you build something on Ethereum, they can actually move into Terra or Solana or other kind of protocol. So you you know everything everything can be um, the, the chain agnostic uh, by like two years later. So I think I'm very interested, exciting about what's uh, what's going to be happening in the future. I think the interchain inter inter and interoperability is something that I'm very excited about, and they can actually bring the user experiences better because you know. The application on Ethereum can take advantage of um, Solana and other uh, other public chain that has um, higher scalability. So I think it can actually bring a lot of people to the chain. Absolutely, the multi-chain future is here. Uh, well, for me, it's fingers crossed F 2.0 because man, these gas fees are just depressing. So uh, I'd love to see that, and I like that the F team is now. Um, uh, prioritize the uh, the staking instead of the sharding, so I think uh, that should actually move it along a lot quicker. But we can bug Vitalik about it tomorrow, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, he's gonna be here. Yeah. Oh. We're having a, a panel tomorrow. Uh, I believe he'll he'll be here. All right. Definitely check it out. Um, so yeah. So I started talking about the base of the pyramid, and I'm gonna finish up talking about the top of the pyramid, but. Um, I'm very excited about the interoperability between the crypto and digital assets and traditional assets. I think that's a huge opportunity that a lot of the big institutions are working with. That's something that me and in, in our company, we're kind of playing a part in, 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 in building the data infrastructure to kind of imitate the one from traditional finance to enable these big institutions to step into our world. Um, and we both know that like the, the blockchain the blockchain innovation is way more efficient than the ancient traditional systems that are running right now. So I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity going forward. I suppose for me, um, I'm really excited to see uh, some of these other layer one chains uh, get some more consumer traction and more mass consumer adoption because it seems like they're moving really, really fast. The fees are much lower. And then kind of an extension of that is also the production of media on these various chains. Um, I think that's going to be really exciting if you know, we can get to a point where it's you know, mom or dad or grandma are able to uh, consume media on chain. That's going to uh, really, I think, take everything to another level. Definitely. Um, Close us out. Yeah, so uh, definitely. I think the future is the revolution. And I think the revolution is content monetization with NFTs, right? Just like you said with the media on NFTs and on chain. Um, I think that where it's going to start right now is where art is essentially distributed with NFTs sold. Uh, and then we're going to start to see where it's just going to completely uh, change and revolutionize where actually people are going to be able to authenticate goods, uh, actual luxury goods with NFTs, right? And you're going to start to see like, major brands start to utilize NFTs as a day-to-day, -day, um, you know, figure to actually be like, hey, this is actually Louis V or this is Gucci, this is Yeezys, uh, you know, Yeezys. Um, and I think that that's going to, like, be the biggest shift. And once start, like, brands and big conglomerates start using NFTs, it's just game over, right? That's the mass adoption. So <laughs> <laughs> NFTs are the future. It's going to start with the revolution of artists, content monetization, and move into authentication. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you all for participating in Masari's Bonfire. Uh, for everyone, uh, just so you know, programming will start at 9.30 in the morning. So we hope to see you back here in the main ballroom at 9.30. Uh, and again, thank you all. Uh, the bar is still running, so uh, feel free to grab a drink. Uh, and we will see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. <laughs>